by remaining on the call, you automatically consent to having your image and your name as it appears on your little little uh, window pane uh, appear on the uh, the internet on our U on our YouTube YouTube channel and through our website. And uh, you won't receive any compensation for that. Okay, uh, so uh, so if you do not it, so if you do not consent, then um, just don't speak in that way. <laughs> then you won't appear on screen. Uh, you might actually have uh, your message uh, through the chat. Okay, so I'll hand it over to uh, to Val to introduce our uh, three presenters. We've got Ryan Burkholder uh, from Outer Toronto. Uh, uh, Tanya Skuja from Fairway Gorge in Victoria, and Annette uh, uh, Verpio uh, out of Montreal. Uh, over to you, Val. Okay, thanks, uh, Ron. So good evening, everybody, and thanks for coming. I know the weather is fantastic both in Montreal and Toronto, and now I'm hearing it's fantastic out west. So thanks for being here when you could be sitting outside or out on the water. Um, so over the past few weeks at some of these events, listening to some of the concerns that people have um, about uh, things like not being able to get into a canoe after a huli, um, and also from a bit of my own experience of a little bit of overtraining and living with pain and, and injuries, um, I thought it might be a good idea to start thinking about taking care of our athletic bodies and not just taking care of our canoes, um, which was a great talk a few weeks ago, but now let's start taking care of us. So all three speakers that we have tonight work with um, athletes of different levels, keeping them nimble for various reasons, to, especially to keep them pain free, but also to help take care of injuries and to help prevent injuries and just to um, basically have higher performance in their sport. So um, first I'll, I'll introduce uh, each one of them and then each one of them will have a little bit of a present, uh, presentation to do on their part tonight. By the way, there are two speakers that are going to be demoing what they do. So if you want to get up and try it, by all means, please do so. Um, but we will also have resources for you after if you want to go back and try these things on your own later. Okay, so uh, Ryan uh, who is currently in Montreal, by the way, um, but normally he's in Toronto. Ryan, you want to tell us a little bit about your background and how you work with athletes? Sure, absolutely. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me. It's awesome to see groups like this kind of getting together in sort of a challenging time. It's one of the encouraging things that we've seen throughout the last year is how people come together and uh, are innovative in the ways that they can connect with one another. And so I think it's awesome that you guys are doing these chats and uh, I appreciate you having me. A um, bit about my background, I'm a manual osteopath. Um, which is a form of manual therapy for those unfamiliar. It's similar to like chiropractic with a bit more of a holistic approach, generally speaking. Um, and I got into that after a career in, in ice hockey. Um, after hockey, playing uh, both semi-professionally and at the college level, I had searched, you know, and had many different treatments. And it was uh, through a manual osteopath who had kind of corrected an issue with my liver, which actually corrected sort of a chronic issue through my back. And so after that experience, I, I had kind of, it opened my eyes to looking at the body from more of a comprehensive view, kind of more of a wide view and how everything really is interconnected as, uh, as human beings and, and a back issue, a hip issue could be coming from somewhere else. And so again, first it was the first hand experience of, of being helped from a from an osteopath and from the osteopathic approach and then later on it was uh it was more so um yeah it was more so just the the ph philosophical approach of, of osteopathy that really drew me in and so i've been using that approach in my work uh i graduated in 2018 and so now i use it in my practice where i, I work with lots of hockey players still i'm still connected to that sport and that world i also work with uh i've worked with some, some tennis players um, and then everyday sort of weekend warriors, as well as just casual athletes and people that uh, aren't necessarily doing their sport professionally, but still take it quite seriously, uh, which I think is important and admirable. And, and sometimes those are 
often uh, my favorite people to help, the ones that are just in it to enjoy it and to take care of themselves and improve themselves and, and get kind of the most out of their body and, and experience uh, life in a, in a positive way from it. Okay, so you're going to love this group, Ryan, because that's all of us here. What you awesome. just said about the positive you know, enjoying life, moving the body thing. I think that's something that's common right across the board of paddlers, no matter what level. I'm going to come back to you, Ryan, but first I, I want Tanya, a lot of you will probably know Tanya if you're in the Victoria area. Uh, so Tanya, would just want to tell us a little bit about your background and um, your approach to working with athletes? Yeah. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Tanya. Uh, I know actually quite a few of you guys because I see you here at Waterfront Fitness or to the Fairway Gorge Paddling Club as well. Um, yeah, I've been working here for like, three years now and I've worked with a whole lot of paddlers. Uh, you guys are amazing. You work the hardest out of any clients that I've ever had. Um, and once I show you the benefits of actually like moving your body like through its full range of motions and how you can reduce pain and actually get your body feeling really good and, and mobile. Um, you guys take it in stride and you just like you go for it. So I really, really enjoy working with all you guys. Um, but in my background, I've been playing sports my entire life. I love sports, um, but with sports come injuries. Uh, I've worked through a number of injuries myself and um, just learning about the body and taking that holistic approach, uh, learning how the body works together, um, that whole mind-body connection really benefits in terms of coming back from injuries, um, improving yourself in your sport, um, and then even not just in your sport, just your everyday life. Yeah. Great, super. I, I think um, <clears throat> a lot of us can relate to um, the whole mind body connection, but also the idea of like when you're feeling pain free and your body's feeling healthy, you're going to perform at a much higher level than uh, if you're injured or in uh, some kind, if you have some kind of chronic pain. So I'm just going to have um, Annette uh, introduce herself. Annette's out of uh, Posture Pro in Montreal. And uh, she also deals with athletes of all different uh, levels. Uh, she has a little bit of a different approach, but it's still connected to our other presenters. So Annette, you want to talk just briefly about what you do, and then I'm going to go back to Ryan. Okay, sorry, Annette, you're muted. You have to unmute yourself. Sorry about that. <laughs> Uh, so thank you so much for the opportunity, Val, uh, specifically, uh, thank you uh, for giving me this opportunity. My, my background really, uh, I started off as a rehab specialist back in 2004. And um, one of the main challenges that I saw in my practice was uh, the ability to create changes that would last through time. And uh, following this, uh, this dilemma that I faced fairly quickly early on in my practice, uh, I come from a family of doctors, and I was uh, very quickly uh, presented through um, to uh, the to the, the the realization that although I was helping people uh, to um, feel better and move better, the results that I was providing were were short term. And uh, one day I was expressing my frustration to uh, to my uncle, who basically said to me, "Well, you know." Um, a lot of the things that you're dealing with pretty much comes from, from the way that the brain is, is pretty much managing all of the symptoms that, that you're seeing in the body. Uh, so I kind of took that reasoning back to my, uh, to my um, uh, teacher in school who, and, and I basically asked him and I said, you know, I'm, I'm dealing with a shoulder problem here. I'm doing everything that's being taught at school. And uh, although I am providing relief, uh, why is it that I'm not actually able to fix the problem on, on a permanent basis? And uh, I saw in his eyes that he really didn't have an answer for me. And, and I, I also saw that he uh, was a little bit confused by what I was asking. And I, I kind of understood instinctively that there was something, you know, that basically he, he really did not have the answer. This was not something that was taught in school to him. Hence, this was not something that was going to be taught to me in school. So 
Uh, that being said, from 2004 moving forward on to today, uh, I decided to kind of uh, look into how the brain was managing movement and all of the things that was, you know, that we're pretty much looking on, on uh, we're pretty much trying to resolve on a daily basis. And this is what led me to Charles Poliquin, who introduced me mostly to the athletic uh, population. Um, I work with weekend warriors, with children, with elderlies, with anyone that's really looking to, um, to improve their performance. And uh, my concept and my philosophy is that uh, anyone who's looking to be on the true path to, to fitness has to uh, accept that the nervous system is essential for longevity. And, and my goal and my passion is to treat the cause rather than managing symptoms. So up to date, um, I'm passionate about work, working with children. I believe that prevention really is, um, that everything really does start with prevention, hence with the children, if you can catch a problem as far as early brain development in the early stages of life, that's when you'll have the most massive impact. But I'm also passionate to work with athletes because they are the ones that have the a nervous system that is the most fine tuned as fine as far as being able to uh, perform those different um, uh, those results and actually when you actually start to tune their nervous system then they start to uh, see the benefits much much quicker than someone who's more you know more of a computer uh, or sedentary uh, lifestyle and um, and yeah so uh, so once again thank you for this opportunity and, and I look forward to uh, to presenting my uh, my concepts to you oh, fantastic thanks Annette Okay, so we'll get back to Annette later, who's going to sort of make that connection between the nervous system. But um, I think all of these presenters are really big on uh, functional movement and making sure that we stay mobile. So we're going to start with Ryan. And uh, Ryan's going to talk a little bit about uh, how we want to approach this and give us a few examples of what can help us specifically as padder paddlers. Go ahead, Ryan. Yeah, so I think uh, to talk about my approach and, and how I would kind of go about helping you guys both on the water as well as kind of coming off of the water, um, giving you a bit of a background on the principles of osteopathy. There's two in particular that I think are kind of uh, pertaining to this subject uh, and kind of how you'll see in sort of the two exercises that I'll show, which you guys should, should get a document afterwards that I kind of created that you can try these, these exercises or stretches on your own afterwards. Um, but those will outline these two principles. And the first one is essentially what I, what I was touching on earlier, where the body really is an interconnected unit. And whether it's through the nervous system, the vascular system, the fascial system, which is like your soft tissue, your connective tissue, uh, the body really is uh, a functioning interconnected unit. And so if you look at like the, the rowing stroke, for example, it's not just like the, the brain or the nervous system to kind of uh, piggyback on what Annette is talking about. The nervous system doesn't just say, okay, lat contract, uh, um, ex uh, extend the shoulder to bring the, sh the paddle through the water. It, it, it is a complex and complicated movement pattern that's highly synchronized and it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing that we can make these complicated movements happen without really having to think about each individual muscle that has to contract uh, in order to do it. What we do is we think about the task. And so that kind of outlines this principle of osteopathy where everything really is connected. And so to treat the human body, to treat any sort of dysfunction in the human body, you have to see the entire body and where the dysfunction might be coming from. So a shoulder issue or a shoulder symptom, I should say, isn't always driven by a shoulder issue. What you feel and experience here could be being uh, contributed by a neck issue or lack of rotation through your thoracic spine. And so I think that's a pr particularly helpful thing to think about uh, how osteopathy and the osteopathic approach can uh, translate into, you know, what you guys are trying to do uh, both on the water and also just, you know, making sure that what you do on the water doesn't start to create any dysfunction for what you want to do outside of those activities as well. Um, and so the second, the second principle is that the body also has this amazing ability to self-regulate, self-heal and regenerate. Um, it's an adaptive mechanism, right? That's what makes us human beings, which is 
uh, the good news and the bad news because it will adapt to its demands. Uh, and if we're not careful with what those demands are, again, we can adapt in ways like, uh, again, like Annette was suggesting, like whether it's say, say it's a sedentary lifestyle, the body will adapt to that lifestyle. And then if you want to then go do something that's active and it's not well adapted for that uh, activity, then it can cause dysfunction. It can cause, you know, acute traumatic injury, all these types of things, or it just has these chronic patterns that ultimately become dysfunctional. Um, and so those two principles, I think, are, are particularly interesting as we look at, you know, how you guys can maintain your own bodies. Because, again, if the body has the ability to self-regulate, self-heal, regenerate, if we give it the right inputs, if we put it through some uh, productive things, some intentional things that help us to not only perform better on the water, but also make sure that that repetitive strain in the boat, forgive my... Uh, my form, I'm sure you guys could, could pick it apart here. But um, yeah, we will also wanna make sure we're not adapting too much to that repetitive pattern because the truth is you want to do other things other than just being on the boat. You wanna make sure you can get out of the boat and go for a walk afterwards without you know tight lower back, uh, cramping in the hips or anything like that. And so those two things, uh, Again, this is how osteopathy can kind of play a role in, in both the longevity as well as the maintenance uh, of, the, of the body in your sport. And so in one of, the, one of the approaches that I've discovered since my training in osteopathy is an approach from an osteopath named Guy Boyer who created this system based on these principles of osteopathy, but he did it in a way where it was more so using exercise, less so using like a therapist like myself, manipulating the body on the table. So he created this, this series or this sequence or this entire approach of how, again, whether it's on Zoom or whether it's uh, you know in the actual gym, coaching somebody through certain types of exercises, certain stretches, certain ways to decompress the spine, uh, can be a helpful way to use these principles, but to allow um, to allow the athlete to be part of the recovery process and be, and and you know really taking advantage of that process that happens within the body that can heal itself. And so um, yeah, so to give you guys two examples of these, I'll show you. One is going to be a, a myofascial stretch. Okay, again, this is a, an approach of Guy Boyer's. It's going to be a stretch for your hip flexor. And again, if we think of, you know, being in the boat and rowing, you're in a flexed position for the hips, especially too, if you're, if you're working during the day or if you're seated often during the day, these hips are going to be short throughout a, a good portion of the day. It's not necessarily a bad thing. A lot of people will talk about how like sitting is the new smoking. I don't necessarily agree with that because sitting is a nice restful position. But if we do too much of it and we don't adapt and ask our body to do other things, then that's when it becomes a problem. And so the first, the first exercise that I'll show you is gonna be a stretch, a myofascial stretch for the hip flexor. And what you'll see in it is there's gonna be positioning of the arm that's important. There's positioning of the heel that's important. And so it's not simply just extending the hip. It's taking the entire fascial system into tension to open and release the, the intended tissue. And that's where it's, again, it's a stretch that, that uses that approach of the body being an entirely connected unit. And then the second stretch is going to be uh, an Eldoa. The Eldoa is essentially a tool to decompress the spine. If any of you guys, hopefully you guys have never had to experience like a traction machine to give you a sort of relief and some decompression of the spine. But essentially our bodies are designed to have the ability to do that if they're coached and, uh, and done that way. And so um, the, the second exercise is going to be specifically about decompressing through the, uh, the thoracic spine, particularly at the segment T6, T7. Why that's important in your sport is to maintain your ability to rotate through that thoracic spine. Again, that's the area where, where our, our body is designed to rotate. And if we lose that ability to rotate through here, we're gonna make an action like this. It's gonna come all from the arms or it might come from you know, some compensation at the neck. Some rotation might come from the lower back. And so all these things could contribute to dysfunction. So again, these are ways to just uh, maintain your optimum function of your body. These are two uh, stretches that I thought would be particularly helpful for one, maybe just kind of giving an example of the approach, but also what could be more specific to you guys. 
So I'll, uh, I'll take you through those two exercises real quick. I'll take you to the living room here. Okay, so the first one, again, this, uh, this is to stretch a hip flexor called your psoas. Okay, I'm gonna show you on a little bit of an angle. And again, whether you wanna try it at home or whether you want to, you'll have a resource given to you afterwards. Um, you'll just get a sense of the exercise and how this approach works and looks, okay? So if I'm stretching my right psoas muscle, I come into a kneeling position and I'm gonna go into a posterior tilt of my pelvis, okay? So that's, you can think like you're pulling your pubic bone up toward your own belly button and sending your tailbone toward the ground, okay? And then I'm gonna take my heel out back and I'm rotating it out just outside of this knee here. Okay, so I'm causing an internal rotation of the hip, which is an opposing action of that muscle that we're stretching. Okay, and then lastly, I'm gonna push the crown of my head up toward the ceiling to create some stretch, to create some decompression there. And I'm gonna bring my arms into tension. Okay, so I'll go into, like I'm making a stop sign, and then I'm gonna go into external rotation of the arms. And then lastly, maintaining everything that I've built, I'm gonna come into a little bit more hip extension. And notice how that's all the hip extension that I've got right now, when I create all those positions of the pelvis, of the spine, keeping neutral. Typically, I would hold this under tension for about 30 seconds, maybe for three rounds, or you could do it for uh, 60 seconds for one round, okay? So again, it's important that you do both sides. That would be the myofascial stretch for the psoas. Now I'll show you the demonstration for the eldoa. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. Before you do the eldoa, I have a question. Sure. Oh, and by the way, everybody, I should have said this sooner, but please, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat. There'll be time at the end to answer questions as well if you want to raise your hand for any of the speakers. Okay, so Ryan, where are you feeling that and why do you have to turn out that back leg? Mm -hmm. So where I, mean, I obviously feel it, you're going to feel it in the psoas, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, yeah, hopefully. But the thing about the myofascial stretches is you won't always necessarily feel it at the target of like the muscle specifically. Again, because it's a myofascial stretch and it's putting the it's targeting the entire chain of fascia. Some people might feel that in the quad. Some people might get it in in the psoas. Which again, for just for reference, the psoas comes and attaches kind of behind your belly button to the, the lower back. And so again, it, it can be an important muscle to stretch for like sciatic issues, for hip issues. Uh, again, lower back, any lower back dysfunction, it can be a really important muscle to stretch. But again, when I put that into, into stretch, yeah, if my quad, like the, the, the fascia that comes and connects to my quad is tighter than, than up further up into the psoas, I'll feel the stretch here, which is not necessarily a bad thing, uh, you're going to get the release where you need it along that chain. Um, and so, yes, typically you're going to feel it to the front of the hip or the quad. Um, but if you're doing it well and, and uh, you're executing well, it's, it's not necessarily going to feel like an isolated stretch. So, yeah, good question. Okay. You can carry on. <laughs> okay. Awesome. So, yeah. So the next one. Again, this is a good example of where you might not feel it specifically, but if there's tightness anywhere in the chain, you're gonna feel it wherever that fascia is tight and restricted. So this one, again, I'll try to show the best angle, which will probably be from seated. I'm gonna have my knees crossed. If that's an issue at all, you can kind of bring your feet a little further out, but ideally you have those knees crossed, legs crossed, and you're sending those knees down towards the floor, like you're really kind of bringing them towards the floor to create that tension and to kind of fix the tissue in the lower back. And then again, very important for the Eldoa is understanding what neutral spine feels like. And so from this position, the best way to, to bring yourself into neutral spine is to bring your belly button back toward your own spine and drawing it up towards your heart. And if you notice, you can even see how that kind of brings me a little bit taller. And then I'm going to lift through my thoracic spine. So pointing my chest toward the ceiling and then tucking my chin to come back. Now you'll notice I've probably gained a little bit of height, but the effort is pretty considerable here. 
Okay. So the effort, it will feel like work and I stretch like this. And as I continue to push the crown of my head up toward the ceiling, from the opposite end, I'm pushing my tailbone into the ground. And then I'll take my hands out front, gentle contact of my fingertips and bringing them up toward the ceiling. Okay, from here, I just hold, but I maintain all those points of intention. So I'm reaching my hands up toward the ceiling, continuing to push my knees toward the ground, pushing my crown of my head up toward the ceiling and holding for breath. So here you can really think like you're using the arms to lift the rib cage away from the hips. Okay, and again, the idea behind that is so that you're giving yourself the space for those, those joints of the mid back to have the space to function and mainly to rotate. But with these aldoas, again, because they treat the body as a whole, what you'll notice is, okay, you might be doing this for a back issue, but all of a sudden your digestion is better because you know the, the digestive organs receive important circulation, innervation, all these things from that segment of the spine. And so again, resolving one issue could also resolve other dysfunctions. Um, other details that are important when you're in that stretch, you essentially want to hold for 60 seconds. So the myofascial stretches, you want to hold for 30 to 60. The aldoas you want to hold for uh, as close to a minute as possible. Uh, and then, yeah, typically you want to hold for about 60 seconds. Okay. And so, as I mentioned, uh, I created a document with those two things. I know there's a lot of details within both of those uh, exercises, but typically because of, yeah, the comprehensive approach, what makes those exercises a little bit complicated, sometimes a little bit frustrating to do is also what makes them super effective. Um, and that's why, again, sometimes if you're just trying to stretch the quad by lengthening the quad and you're just not getting something to stick, again, to use uh, Annette's term, sometimes it's more of an issue of the entire chain. And so using these specific as well as comprehensive types of stretches can be, can be super helpful and super effective. So... Ryan, would you say that one of the big differences here is between just a regular stretch and this is that you are hitting a whole chain or a whole group of things instead of um, focusing on one muscle? Is that like yeah, a so, fundamental yeah. difference? Typically, yes. Like these stretches or like this approach is typically going to focus on more of the fascial system, which, um, yeah, the fascial system is is this sort of web of connect, connective tissue, the soft tissue that, that really does connect everything in the whole body. So it runs all throughout the body and the, both the health as well as the function of this fascia can really dictate, you know, the function, the health, the performance, uh, the experience, how, how things feel through uh, the muscles themselves. And so generally speaking, yeah, if it, those isolated stretches, say for like a quad example, for example, um, yeah, they're just trying to take two lengths of the muscle and increasing that length. Whereas this one is not necessarily concerned about lengthening, but improving the quality uh, and the health of the tissue as well. Okay. So I, I have a few questions before I want to move on to Tanya. One is um, just, again, clarification on the frequency and duration. You're saying that the myofascia stretches are about 30 seconds, the aldoa about 60, and you want to do two to three reps. Is that the idea? Yeah. So that's a, that's a general guideline. When I'm working with people, um, like the difference between not doing it and doing one set is massive. The difference between doing like one and three sets is, is very little. So typically what I'll say to people is like, Start with one, do one set. If, if it feels particularly restricted and like you need another set and you've already you know, got some momentum on your side, you're doing another stretch, then do another round. And if again, the second round you start to feel a release, uh, then maybe that's enough. The third round will probably take care of things, but typically one to three rounds is a, is a general guideline. Um, it's not like a set in stone thing. Again, this is the way that I work and recommend things. But yes, the myofascial stretch, you want to hold at least 30 seconds, probably no more than 60 seconds. 
And the Eldoa you want to hold more like a minute. Um, and yeah, typically not too much more. If you wanted to make it a bigger stretch or like a deeper stretch, there are ways you can take it deeper just by different areas to focus on and factors of progression. And that would be a better way to get better results rather than just increasing uh, duration. So can I ask you, tell me if this is correct. When I'm watching you do those demonstrations, I always feel like you're reaching in opposite directions. In other words, your hands were reaching forward, your foot in that first one, and your foot, you were thinking about the heel going to behind you and your head is going towards the ceiling and the pelvis is go is reaching. So would you say it's true to think of it always as reaching in the most, all of the opposite directions that you can at the same time? Yeah, I think that's one way of describing it. I think, uh, again, based on like more of like the pure description from like Guy is the way he would describe it is like, you're, you're just doing whatever it takes to put the fascia into tension. Um, and so for, for those that that doesn't mean much to, I think, yeah, you're, you're essentially trying to decompress. And so to decompress things, yes, it does involve kind of like a, a bit of a tug of war between two things. And that's where, again, this can be this type of stretching, these exercises um, are not necessarily the easiest to execute. Um, and for that reason, they can be frustrating, but also again, for that reason, that's where they can be super effective because they do get so specific and targeted. Um, they can get that release that, uh, that is needed uh, more so than just a, a generic stretch that you know, doesn't really require too much awareness, doesn't really require too much uh, effort or, or tension. But yeah, so long answer short to your question. In most cases, it's good to think about, yes, kind of creating space. So going in opposite directions, like for the psoas, for example, you're pushing the knee into the ground and you're driving the crown of the head toward the ceiling. And again, just, just now you can see how I kind of get that length. And uh, you're just training your, your body for optimal posture and you're taking the tissue that pulls it out of that suboptimal posture and you're opening up so it allows for that. Um, I just want to put a bit of my own testimony out there. Those two exercises that Ryan just did, that second one, sitting on the floor with the arms above your head, 15 seconds into that, I will be dripping in sweat when I'm doing it for real. Like he's not joking when he says this is work, just watching him right now. Although he's a hockey player, we can see he's tight in the hips like we are. Um, <laughs> yeah, it looks a little different from when, uh, from when some other people do it. I, I have some, I have my own restrictions. For sure. Is it okay to sit on a yoga block when you do that? Or is that not okay? Cause your legs aren't aligned in the same way. Yeah. So you bring up, uh, you bring up a good question where, you know, using props to modify the stretches. I think at that point, um, when you're starting to change the stretches, it becomes that much more important to work with a coach. Um, just because, Again, these modifications have certain intentions and you don't want to lose the intention by modifying. Um, if you're playing around with it and it starts to feel good and you want to kind of have easier access, I think, yes, it's okay to use a yoga block. Like you're not going to hurt yourself. It's not like risky of it, uh, or anything like that. Um, but you might lose the intended target. Um, but, but there are ways to do it where it's like some people are so restricted where it's like you can get it on the yoga block and make the modifications, but the modification might be more so like the, the positioning of the hands and things like that. Um, so again, short answer. Yeah, it's probably fine to use a yoga block. You just might not get the fully intended stretch. Okay. And just one more question and then don't go away because we might have some more later, but I know that there are many, many Eldoas and probably tons of myofascia stretching. So where can people go aside from the document that we're gonna give everybody to get more um, information on Eldoa stretching or myofascia stretching? Right, so this is, this is a, a great question. Um, this, is, this was kind of my issue when I first discovered Aldoas is they're hard to find information on. And so um, right now I'm kind of in the process of doing my best of kind of creating some resources for that. I think a place uh, 
a good place for some resources. And there's even some videos on uh, on Instagram on Lisa's page, which I can share the link to afterwards, or you might have it, uh, which is Eldoa Quebec. Um, there's lots of good information there. She's she's a little bit better at creating content around this stuff, whereas typically I'm I'm working with people more on one on one basis. But I would say that would probably be the best the best place to look for stuff like that. Okay, so Eldoa Quebec right now is the one of the better resources. Yeah, and again, there's not many just because she, Lisa puts up demos on her Instagram, right? She does. She even has like some some videos like on her IGTV and things like that that she was doing in the first lockdown. And uh, some of those protocols are, are excellent. I've done them and even again in the first in the first lockdown. Uh, I was, you know, having some shoulder issues of my own and it's just like a general protocol that she put together and, and it was helpful for me. So I think doing those like having her guidance in real time is super helpful and um, it's a good way to kind of get a sense for these things. Otherwise, um, yeah, I'm just trying to think of some some classes. There might be some classes available, people doing some online stuff, and I could definitely look for that and, and share afterwards. Okay, that that would be great. Okay, mm -hmm. so um, before we run out of time, we're going to move on to uh, Tanya at, at uh, the um, Waterfront Fitness Center, and Tanya is going to also show us a few ways. She's also going to be working with fascia, but working out some kinks that she knows us paddlers suffer from on a regular basis. So thanks, Ryan. Don't go away in case there's more questions. And uh, Tanya, the floor is yours. Literally, Hi, look at that nice floor behind you. <laughs> I'm all ready. <laughs> thanks so much, Val. Um, that's exactly it. I'm going to take you guys through a couple really good um, rolling techniques, show you a bit of the tools that I often use myself and I use with all my clients, uh, a lot of the paddlers that come and join me in class uh, and the ones that I see in person here in the gym. Um, so very similar to what Ryan was talking about earlier about fascial tissue and how the whole body is connected. Um, uh, I'm going to show you some trigger points that will help to start releasing some of those, maybe some sticky spots that you may have. Like Ryan mentioned, when you're doing that uh, psoas stretch, uh, you may feel that stretch into your quads. Well, I'll show you how to roll your quads so that maybe that can release a little bit and you can get a little bit more into that targeted area that you would like to stretch. So, I will show you some of the tools that I use all the time. Some of my favorites, absolutely. This lovely little roller, you can get them anywhere, even at like HomeSense, Walmart, whatever you got, you can get cheap ones, you can get more pricey ones, these ones are a little bit more fancy. And then some not so expensive tools are lacrosse balls, your new best friend, and maybe even a softball. This one's a, uh, really good for getting in through the hips, um, when Ryan mentioned the psoas and how it's deep behind your belly button, uh, this is a really good tool to really just dig in there um, and release those, those tight hips. Another tool that I really, really love to use, this is really great for your thoracic spine, so good for paddlers. Um, it may not feel like it when you first start using it, but it'll become your friend. Taking two lacrosse balls and just putting them in a sock, easy as that. You can buy more expensive forms of this exact same thing in stores, but honestly, you just take two lacrosse balls, throw them in a sock, tie it up, and you're good to go. Um, so, I'm gonna just demonstrate really good thoracic spine roll. And then we're also gonna get into our lats and then a little bit into our lower body, so our hips and our quads. The reason why rolling out our thoracic, thoracic spine is important is because as paddlers, right, we want to make sure that we get that good sit and reach, right, through every stroke. So if we have a really, really tight thoracic spine, we can't get that same reach. So what you're going to do is just take the roller and we just lie directly on top of it, just at the base of the rib cage. Always try to keep your neck nice and relaxed and comfortable so you can cradle your head with your hands. From here, all you're gonna do is you're gonna lift the hip up and just slowly roll through your back. 
The important things when you're rolling is to make sure that you stay nice and relaxed. Uh, you never really want to be bracing yourself through the rolling. I always tell people that when you have to squint and brace yourself, like you're, you're wincing almost in pain, that's a little bit too much. When it comes to like trigger points, you want it to be uncomfortable, but comfortable at the same time. It's kind of like a little bit of an oxymoron, but that's how it is. On a scale of one to 10, if you're using like a pain scale, you want to stick anywhere between that five to like seven range. It's a really good happy spot. Now, when you're doing some rolling, you can also add in other movements along with it. And that's just gonna increase the amount that you can get out of that compression. So when you're rolling at your thoracic spine, you're gonna place your hips down, you're gonna brace your core. And then from here, you're gonna inhale and slightly crunch in and exhale and reach back. Now what that does is it just bends your thoracic spine over the roller and keeps that movement right in through the targeted area. So you can repeat this up and down a couple of times and then repeat the exact same thing all the way up your thoracic spine. Now, I actually want, if you guys have either a lacrosse ball or a, even a soup can, a roller, anything like that, this is your time to participate if you would like. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab a little lacrosse ball and I'm going to show you guys how much your fascial tissue can improve your mobility. First of all, we don't need the tool. We're just going to sit on our bum and we're going to have our legs out in front of us. From here, what I want you to do is posture up nice and tall. Feel like somebody's pulling a string out the top of your head and then you're going to do just a basic sit and reach. Right, so you're going to keep the legs straight, don't let them bend up, and you're just going to reach for your toes. You can give it a go. Well, sit and reach. Great, I love it. People are participating. That's awesome. Okay, that's great. Now, try to remember where your arms were, what that felt like. Um, maybe take a little screenshot of where you were. And then you're going to take your tool. Now you can use the lacrosse ball, you can use a roller, you can use even a dumbbell if it has rounded edges. And we're going to roll out our feet. Yeah, I don't know if you can see my feet. Let's angle this down just a little bit. Okay. We're going to roll out our feet one at a time. So taking our tool, you're just going to place your weight on that tool, so whether it's the ball, the roller, whatever you got, and you're slowly going to roll to the center of your foot. Now remembering that pain scale, right? We want it to be uncomfortable, but comfortable enough so that you can relax. And right? you're gonna roll through just the center of your foot, taking your time. If you find any spots that are a little bit twingy, almost as if it's like, Kind of electric feeling what i want you to do is take your toes and i want you to curl and extend the toes and so you're going to work through that tissue just a little bit curl and extend and you're slowly going to work your way all the way from the balls of your feet all the way to your heel now you can also roll through the inside edge of your foot and doing the exact same thing Curling and reaching those toes. And you can do the outside edge. It's a little hard with a lacrosse ball, but you can do it. And then the nice thing about doing this on the ground is you can add or take away as much pressure as you need, right? So you add more weight to it. It's going to increase that sensation. Or if you ease off of it, vice versa. All right, that's about enough time on that one. But now before you switch feet, you could just place your other foot back down on the ground and you could probably feel that there's a bit of a difference between the two feet. Like one of the, your, the one that you just rolled will feel really nice and grounded, whereas the other one might feel like it's crunched up. So now we're gonna do the same thing on the other side. 
Again, just rolling through the center of your foot, nice and slow, taking your time and breathing, relaxing. And then adding in your toe curls and your extensions, slowly through your foot. And then also going through inside and outside edges. Now, when you're doing this on your own, you can take as much time as you like. But today we're just going to go a little bit faster. Inside and outside edges. And then once you're done, we're going to retest that same sit and reach. So you're going to sit back down on your bum. You're going to lengthen your legs out in front of you. Lift the chest, pull the shoulders back and down. Right? And we're just going to sit and reach for those toes. Now for me, I mean, I was already able to reach my toes. But if you try it at home, you may see that, that difference from when you initially started to when you finished. What that tells us is that, yeah, everything is very interconnected, right? So rolling at your feet can change how far you can hinge, right? That stretch through the hamstrings. So it's just one little, little tidbit of how our fascial system is all connected. Now, other important spots to roll as a paddler are all in through those hips. Now we spend so much time sitting in that boat nice and nice and crunched up in through the hips. We gotta give them some love. So you're gonna take your ball, you can either have a softball, a cross ball, whatever you have, and you can roll through not only your psoas, right? Now to landmark that, I like to take my hip bone and my belly button and draw a dotted line between the two. And that is where that ball is gonna go. So you take the ball and you're just gonna lie directly on top of it. Now from here, I want you to take your opposite leg and you're just gonna bend your knee out towards the side and pull your heel in towards that same leg. What that does is it just puts our hip into extension and allows the ball to kind of sink in a little bit deeper. Now from here, you're just going to move in tiny little movements either up, down, left, or right until you find your trigger point. Once you've found it, you'll know because you'll get a pretty sharp sensation. Again, we only want it to be a moderate sensation, slight uncomfortable. And then you're going to sit and you're going to relax on top of it. The keys to rolling is to make sure that you can always breathe and relax. And that, you know, you can don't overdo it. But doing a little bit every day goes a really long way. So you're going to repeat the same thing on the other side. And then it, it's a really good in combination with a lot of other stretches, um, such as doing run, a lot of Ryan stretches. That would be amazing, the Eldora stretches. Um, or just doing some more isolated stretches as well. But yeah. Any questions so far? I just have one um, question, Tanya. So that last one, I've done that before, but with a, a huge soft yoga ball, it's actually really good for your vagus nerve to relax you and stuff. Yeah. But when you do hit those trigger points when you're working with tools, like when you're working with your foam roller or your killer roller like you have or um, a ball, do you want to stay on that trigger point and try to relax or are you slowly moving around the trigger point to try to work it like does that make a difference is there one that's dangerous is there one that you might do a little bit of damage or well um everybody's actually very different so it depends on um what works best for for the person uh, some people work best is if they hang out on a trigger point and just try to breathe and relax into it. Uh, other people, uh, it, the muscles relax better if you just 
continuously move over top of it. Um, the key is to just really focus on, can I relax through this or is it too much, right? That's when you know that you're gonna get into um, a little bit of danger. If you feel like, and I know we've all been there, like if you roll out your IT bin, you will feel this, right? If you start rolling it and you go, that's how you know that's way too much and you can actually do a little bit of harm rather than good. So making sure that you, it's uncomfortable, you feel like there's something there, but you don't want it to be too much on that, on that very, very uncomfortable scale. You can breathe through it. I always say happy eyebrows. So if you can relax your face, relax your eyebrows, that's a good spot, <laughs> right? Uncomfortable, but comfortable at the same time. I love the happy eyebrow thing. I'd love to see all of us do that in the middle of an outrigger race. Um, right? Happy eyebrows. <laughs> so, and then getting back to the frequency, um, you said a little goes a long way every day, but for you, how long do you tend to stay in these things? I know it's sort of going to depend from person to person, but just give us a little bit of an idea for like, for example, the ball work that you just did under your foot. Yeah. Are we talking five minutes? Are we talking one minute? Um, I would say anywhere. It like, Honestly, if you don't feel a whole lot, it's not worth it to stay on it. <laughs> so if you're not feeling much at all, either get a harder tool uh, and try it that way, or you don't need to. If you're feeling a lot more, like if your body's telling you, hey, there's something here, spend a little bit more time on it. So anywhere from like two to five minutes, right, is a great a great gauge of like how long to spend on one spot. Again, um, if you, if you're coming in right before a workout and you want to mobilize your body, you don't need to spend half an hour on rolling, right? Just give your body a good, like few good spots. Like what am I targeting today? I'm going to target my hips and my T-spine. So then I'm going to spend a good, like maybe five minutes on each, or you could do one minute on a little bit of everything. Um, just really depends on, on the day. You're getting some really nice reactions about your happy eyebrows uh, <laughs> comment. I think I think that's a keeper. I think we'll be saying yeah. that for years happy to come. Eyebrows. Oh yeah. So it doesn't really matter if you're doing this before you go out on the water or when you get off the water? Uh, it doesn't really matter. It depends on what your goal is. If your goal is to mobilize before uh, exercise, right? If you really want to extend that reach before before you go out for a practice, do a bunch of rolling. That's really going to help go a long way. Um, it's also going to help you activate certain muscles. Uh, so, like, let's say um, let's say your hips are really tight, but you really want to be able to hinge properly throughout your your uh, your workout, your training session, right? So you're gonna roll out your hips a good amount before you go out there, um, along with maybe a couple of warm up stretches or whatever. You can also use the, the rolling techniques for recovery afterwards. It's really good to increase um, blood flow and so to create a lot more healing to the area. Let's say you did a sprint workout, right? And you're, your lats are super, super sore, do a little light rolling, right? Um, the day after or right after. That's also a good idea. Yeah. Okay, great. You, I have to say you make this um, seem much less painful than it actually is when we're doing it, when you're saying things like happy eyebrows and you have such a nice right? demeanor about you because we all know that some of this stuff can be pretty painful. Okay, That's how well, I get a lot of people to get through all their rolling. I'm always like, it's great. Enjoy it. You're in your happy place. Like, it's <laughs> <laughs> So Tanya, I, I saw today that you guys demonstrate a lot of this stuff on your Instagram page. We do. Yeah. So how do we find you on Instagram? Is that a waterfront fitness center? It is waterfront fitness. Yes. So you can find us on Instagram. We also have our Facebook page where we post all the same uh, information. Uh, it's really good tool for finding good tips and tricks for rolling, stretching, even exercises. Uh, yeah, so that you feel um, really confident going into the gym or wherever you're going uh, to do those exercises or rolling or stretching. 
Yeah, okay. it's just Waterfront Fitness on Instagram and on Facebook. Okay, so fantastic. So we'll put those up on our page once we get all this organized uh, afterwards. So thank you. Stick around in case there's some yeah. more questions. Thanks. And we're going to move over to Annette, who's going to talk a little bit more uh, mind-body connection, but not like in your yoga class. It's a little different from that. So um, go ahead, Annette, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Val. So yeah, it is it is a little different. And I guess I'll, I'll share my screen at this point. I think that would just be better to, you know, they say an image says a 1000 words. So why not? All right. So um, I'm going to give you some tips uh, that might be slightly different uh, in the sense that instead of working on on muscles and stretching, I'm actually gonna uh, present the concept on, on working on the actual body parts that control muscle tone. So in essence, uh, in order to appreciate this, you um, let me give you a little, a little brief description of, of why this is important. Um, before we move, you, our brain, our nervous system needs to know that we're stable. And it's important to understand that if we have instability in our body, this is going to create sympathetic stress. Anxiety lives in a part of our uh, body that is called the vestibular system, which we see right here. And I like to call these different areas, I'm gonna, just gonna refer to them as sensory organ systems. Why is this important? Because they give very precise information to our brain. So in essence, when you're looking at someone's posture, for example, from the side, and you'll notice that their center of gravity the position of their head in relation to their shoulder and their hip is, this is what I refer to as an anterior or an anterior pelvic tilt. Uh, we can see that the muscles are overcompensating here. There are muscles that are strong, there are muscles that are weaker. And this is understandable because the way that this, this individual is trying to keep themselves upright requires, um, requires energy and contraction from the muscles. But in order for him to not fall forward, there needs to be information that the brain is processing unconsciously uh, that is creating muscle tone. And this is really what we see in most therapies. And this is what I, when I was in, uh, when I studied osteopathy and uh, different types of uh, rehab, uh, like muscle activation technique, technique and active, active release technique, this was one of the concepts that was never really presented to me. So uh, this is important because when the position of your feet, the way that your eyes are tracking the environment is going to affect, affect your postural stability. And all of this information is being processed unconsciously by your brain, which means that you can't, you're not actually aware of this, like your heart rate or your digestion. But this is really inter interesting when we're talking about movement and performance and range of motion and, and muscle adaptation or fascial, fascial adaptation. It's really crucial to understand this because the way that you, your eyes are moving, the weight bearing surfaces on your foot is actually gonna dictate the position and the tension of your muscle and hence the adaptation of your fascial system later on the line. And this is because the longer, the more we repeat a movement, whether it be walking or standing or posture, the more the brain thinks that this posture is, is normal. So in other words, there's an adaptation that starts to set in. So the concepts that I'm going to present are gonna be not to stretch your muscles or your fascia, but rather work on, on the cause of those tensions, which is your weight bearing surfaces, your foot posture, the way that your eyes are tracking, and potentially even relaxing your jaw because all of those components, again, affect muscle tone. So if this is a hard concept to grasp. The best example that I can give as far as how the brain controls movement is when someone has a stroke, uh, depending on which side they have a stroke, half of their body is usually paralyzed. Usually, and hopefully this comes back up to a certain extent, but this is to just bring in the, the idea and the understanding that the brain really does control muscle tone. When there's lack of oxygenation to the brain, you see paralysis on one side of the body. So then why not use this concept as far as using sensory organ systems to have an effect on the brain so that we can have an effect on the spine, on the tonic muscles, so we can then have an effect on 
movement. Now, uh, just to give you a visual representation of how your feet are crucially important, exercises with the feet will simulate the muscles and the joints of that segment, that foot. And that information actually travels all the way up to your brain. So it always goes back to the brain. The brain then picks up this information and is going to uh, give the commands to the tonic or the intrinsic muscles of your spine so that you can actually move in an upright posture without, uh, without hurting yourself. So the first thing that, um, that the, or the first concept that I think would be important to, to, uh, to know is whether or not you have an uneven foot posture. And that's really, this is based on 14 years of studies that we've done. We have a lot of information on force plate that confirms this. When you have what I call a mixed foot, which is one foot is pronated, as you can see on, on your screen, and the other one is supinated, you can, you know, you can see this, the representation of this reality by taking a, a screenshot or a picture of someone's foot on a protoscope, then that's going to create uh, postural misalignments on the entire body. So let me put the things in perspective for you here. This type of put, put foot posture here uh, is not something that we're aware of. But, but if we look at someone's body from the front, this is what they would look like. Their right shoulder would be lowered. This is just in the frontal plane, right? There's three planes of space that we have to look at. So the right shoulder would be lower. Uh, the hip alignment would be lower, uh, perhaps on the same side. It could also be on the, on the opposite side. But at this point, if we're looking at this athlete, this is a basketball player, uh, we can conclude that you know, his, his right side is tighter, his left side is, is weaker. And, and that is correct in, in this moment and in this reality. But if we look at their feet and if we look at his, his feet and his eyes, uh, chances are that he has he has uneven weight bearing surfaces. So if we look at him from the back, we have that mixed foot that starts to uh, reappear again. And we can see this and, and assess these foot postures very simply by, and I have these videos on my YouTube channel or my Instagram channel. If you actually stand up, look straight ahead and just lift one leg off the floor, just pay attention to the movement that one foot is doing in comparison to the other. And uh, seven times out of 10, one foot will pronate and the other one will supinate. Well, that's gonna have repercussions all the way up your spine in the sense that a collapsed foot is going to affect the knee, that's gonna affect the hip, that's going to affect the intrinsic muscles of your spine. Hence, you will have a lower shoulder and a lower hip. So the thing is, is that the way that the nervous system functions is that if we actually stimulate that foot uh, either by stretching the muscle or stimulating the skin or, or putting deeper pressure in that actual foot, that information um, cannot, be temp cannot be permanent simply because of the way that the nervous system functions. So in other words, if I'm rubbing the foot, that information is going up to my spine, number one first, and then it's going to go to my lower brain, my primitive brain, and then it's going to reach the sensory cortex of my brain. So this is a, if I may say, a longer highway in order to get the, the uh, signal to the brain. It's still gonna work, it's still gonna produce results, but those results are going to be temporary. Hence the issue that I had in my practice 14 years ago, uh, when I had a client ask me, well, how many times am I gonna, you know, how many treatments am I gonna need in order to see a difference and feel better and can you make this permanent? So in other words, in, in order to be able to change this, this foot posture, you literally have to change the way that the brain is projecting on the foot because one thing to understand, we're not born this way, we adapt to this type of foot posture, okay? So that's really important. And a lot of the exercises um, uh, that were being shown, I, I love these exercises because they actually go back to what we call primitive reflexes, which are basic movement patterns that all babies do between the ages of zero to 12 months old. And these movement patterns, as humans, we have movement that is embedded in our DNA. And our goal is to be able to activate these movement patterns, these primitive movements so that they can then become postural movements so that we can stand upright. So there's a lot of information and in, in published studies that actually backs this up. We know that when we inhibit sensory input to of the foot, when we neutralize it, whether with ice or we use emla cream to desensitize the foot, 
the individual actually becomes more unstable. So I'm gonna put the emphasis on instability because if you feel unstable in your body, then you will feel unstable in your life, whether it be in sports or whatever it is you're trying to do. And that's going to create stress and anxiety. It's also going to create a problem as far as um, uh, as far as far as biomechanical restrictions because you will have inflammation in your body uh, short uh, short term or long term. So, uh, going back to this, there is uh, definitely uh, when we inhibit the sensory uh, input to the skin, we increase instability. But when we actually improve it through different proprioceptive exercises or stimulation we actually diminish postural oscillation. So this is, this is actually a platform that allows us to see how much energy or energy expenditure someone is spending, uh, standing upright. So the foot is gonna be the first component. Next is gonna be your eyes. And uh, this is really, I, I don't know, I have no idea how this appeared, just, just appeared on my screen. I have like these, <laughs> these this is, um, like somebody's drawing on the screen. But anyways, um, so your eyes is going to be the, the, the second problem in the sense that nine people out of 10 have a diverging eye and don't know it. And you can actually do this test simply by grabbing a pen and putting it on your nose and asking as, you know, the person that you're test testing to look at the tip of the pen. And nine times out of 10, what you will see is that one eye is looking at the tip and the other eye is looking at something completely different. Well, this causes a problem for the brain because first of all, the image that is being seen is different from both eyes. Now, as far as depth perception is concerned, in order for us to appreciate distance and depth perception, both eyes needs, need to receive the same visual input. And keep in mind that this information from the eyes goes where? It goes into the brain, into the visual cortex. Now, this is really important when we're talking about rowing or any exercises that have to do with the upper body because the eye muscles actually feed right into your brain and control what we see, whether it be movements of the shoulder or movements of the head. And you know, specifically C1 and C2, upper trapezius, pec major, deltoids, suboccipitals, all of those muscles are actually under the influence of your eyes. Your jaw also can affect the movement, um, or I should say the tension of those muscles. So when we're talking about shoulder mobility or any types of movement, movements, in my opinion, and from what I've seen over the last 14 years, it's absolutely crucial to uh, look at the way that the eyes are moving because if they're not moving properly, then it's absolutely normal to see restrictions in range of motion with the shoulders or even uh, with, the, uh, with the thoracic spine or even with, with the hip uh, as far as, far as uh, those sensory organs are concerned. So don't forget that postural stability the, the first area where we're going to start seeing compensations in when we're looking at, at, at someone's body or someone's posture is in their muscular system when there is an imbalance with the feet and where, with the eyes. What, does an, what is an imbalance? This is an imbalance. When the eyes are not tracking properly, you have to do the test. And if the foot posture is uneven, that is an asymmetry. So if you ask yourselves how many joints are actually, how many joints in your body are located between your feet and your eyes, all of them. So if at the base, your feet and your eyes are sending improper feedback to your brain, then it's, it's normal to understand that the output is going to be muscular compensations. And we can see that there's unevenness of tone on this image. So again, working on the muscles and strengthening the muscles and stretching the fascia is gonna work, but it's gonna be incomplete because it's the eyes have not been addressed and the foot has not been addressed. Now, before I go into the corrective exercises, because I'm, I am gonna provide some suggestions as far as how to actually uh, address this, uh, this, is, this is really the loop that's going to cause the problem. Is that if, if we have a muscle imbalance, if we have a lower shoulder, for example, or a lower hip, shoulder mobility will be restricted on that side, then that imbalance, that improper position of my joint is going to create a disturbance in my musculoskeletal system. And this disturbance is going to affect, with time, my joint receptor. Let's take the shoulder, for example. 
What that is going to create over time, because posture and movement is a repetitive movement that becomes a habit in the brain in a specific part of the brain called the basal ganglia to be specific, that joint receptor that is now restricted in movement because I have a problem with my feet and my eyes is gonna create an adaptation at the level of my primitive brain and my brainstem and at the level of my brain. Now the basal ganglia starts to kick in, the cerebellum starts to kick in. We're not gonna get into these fancy words but because I'm oversimplifying this, but the point is, is the moment that this becomes changed in the primitive brain, then it's going to cause the muscle spindle to adapt. And once this happens, then it's going to create alterations in movement and joint position, which is exactly what I saw for so many years when I was practicing and working with rehabilitation was the alteration in muscle tone and joint movement. But if I'm not actually changing what's purple here on the screen, which is the information that the brain is sending to the muscle, then I'm only continuing this loop. And this is the muscle imbalance cycle that I've described uh, and that I teach to healthcare professionals and that I practice in my practice to help athletes get better and faster and stronger. Now, what's interesting is that we know that when someone is misaligned, when there's a shoulder that is lower, the brachial plexus becomes compressed. And although they may be right-handed, they're actually gonna be weaker on that side. And um, I worked extensively at the time with Charles Poliquin before, unfortunately, before he passed away. And one of the things that he quantified is that simply by realigning the shoulders, so in essence, if I'm standing like this, right? And if I realign my shoulders through sensory stimulation, because if you do work on the feet, you will realign the shoulders. You don't actually have to work on the problem locally. This is a symptom, it's not a cause. The foot is causing the imbalance, the eyes are causing the imbalance. And the reason that most systems are failing or falling through the crack is because they involve a multi-sensory organ system. What, what is that system? Well, it's exactly what we were looking at here before, that multi-sensory organ system is divided into different professions in the 21st century. But what Charles said to me is when someone's misaligned like this, uh, can you actually make them stronger by realigning them? And I, I had no idea. And one of the things that he, uh, that he tested himself with a dynamometer test is we basically worked on simply on foot stimulation. And by working on foot stimulation, we're then able to realign the shoulders. And what he quantified was that um, and he did three, three different readings at three different points of, in time is that his athletes got 5% stronger, 8% stronger, 5.1 was the first reading, 8% and close to 15% in the third uh, reading. So to put things in perspective for you, 5.1% of increase in strength in an athlete represents one year's training that's in an Olympic athlete. So now uh, if, you, if you project that into, into any athletic sport that you're gonna wanna do to improve your sport and your mobility and your stability, if you start working on the nervous system to have an effect on your muscles, that's always going to be the faster approach because the speed of the nervous system is 114 miles per second. So if I burn you, you feel it instantly because that's how quickly the information is traveling to your brain. The challenge is to make sure that this information stays in the brain. So we don't want you to stay misaligned. We want you to be aligned today, tomorrow, the next day, and when you come back into the office. And that is, in my opinion, the missing link. So how can we test whether or not there is a problem in those sensory organ systems? Well, the first thing that, um, that you have to test is, let me go back here, is the foot, is the foot imbalance. Do you have an imbalance with your foot? If you do, uh, it needs to be rectified. And we know that different proprioceptive exercises are going to help, like, uh, like Tanya just showed, you know, stimulation with the skin of the foot is going to help. But again, that's gonna stimulate the skin of the foot. It's not gonna change the foot imbalance, right? If someone, if someone is walking like this for three years, uh, sensory stimulation with a ball for 30 seconds or even for five minutes is not enough time to undo the adaptation that the person or the athlete has been walking with for X amount of months or X amount of years. But it is a great way though to stimulate, um, it is a great way to stimulate the brain by using a spike ball or whatnot. I've also have uh, given you different exercises here 
The one that I'm actually going to suggest is, um, and you can see this one, uh, you can see this one on my Instagram channel as well, is different proprioceptive exercises just like this. So anything that you're gonna do to work on ankle mobility will help proprioception, but it will not uh, change the foot posture that you've adapted over time. For that, you really do need to work with a brain-based approach. And as Val was saying, it is something that is fairly new, uh, but you know, electric cars are fairly new and that is the future. <laughs> and, uh, and we know that, uh, and we definitely know that the, now we know and we understand that the best source of, of, um, of energy for the brain is uh, is ketones as opposed to sugar. And what I'm trying to say is that, you know, it's time that we kind of evolve from a, a musculoskeletal approach to a brain-based approach in order to treat any problems that we have, but certainly in this example, to uh, definitely increase performance. So to test the foot, figure out if you have a foot imbalance, stand up, look straight ahead, be on a flat platform, lift your leg up and feel the first movement that the foot is doing, that the ankle is doing. Is it pronating? Is it supinating? Make note of that and then compare that with the other foot. Normally the movement of the foot will have, not normally, for sure will have an impact on your knee and on your hip. So you may have torsion in your hip, which is stemming from your feet. Hence, you will have tight hips at this point if your feet are unbalanced, which is normal. Stimulate the foot, stimulate the foot either with a spike ball, either with proprioceptive exercises. You can even use a fork. I love to use a fork or different components and then retest that foot posture and see if that changed or if that helped with your hip mobility and chances are that it will. Uh, repeat the exercise. Everyone's brain and nervous system is different, right? So it's going to depend on, on the person's nervous system as far as how long are those exercises are going to last. But typically with a healthy individual that has a healthy nervous system, the result of the simulation should last for a period of four hours, four hours. And that's going to be the same for the eye exercises that I'm going to suggest. Okay, so that's for the foot. Uh, another thing I want to mention with the foot also, shoes are super important, super important. I'm not saying to train barefoot, but if we're walking all day long with shoes that are, that are squeezing our toes and preventing movement and flexibility of, of our ankle, that's also going to have repercussions on our posture and it's going to have repercussions on our muscles. So looking at shoes is something also that's really, that's really important. Um, okay, we're running out of time. You're going to show us the eye exercise. Now. Yeah, right here. Here we go. Okay. So both eyes here. We, so, so to test this exercise, as I showed before, grab a pen, look at the tip of the pen. And this is what you'll see nine times out of 10. How are you going to fix this? There's different exercises. I like to call them, uh, I like to call them uh, VOR exercises, vestibulo ocular reflex, because if there's a contradiction with the movements of your eyes and the position of your head, you're going to feel unstable. You know, this is when people will tell you they have seasickness, car sickness, or whatnot, if there's contradictive information. So let me just show you how this exercise is done. I think that, you know, again, visually. So one of the exercises that I do here is basically have somebody just simply look at the tip of the pen, uh, look at their thumbs and bring their thumbs close to their eyes and then look away, right? As you can see here, he's actually bringing his eyes closer in and then boom, he's looking straight ahead and then he's bringing his fingers back out and then he's looking again uh, straight ahead. All right, so this is one exercise that I'm going to suggest. Another one is uh, can be seen on, on my YouTube channel. This is the VOR. If you simply just look straight ahead and start moving sideways, actually training your eyes and your vestibular system, that's going to have a direct impact on your neck posture and on your posture generally. And here she's demonstrating the same exercise uh, that we saw uh, that we saw Dwayne doing from the side. And last but not least is going to be the opposition. You turn your head to the left and you look at your finger to the right and vice versa. So you are training your eyes and your vestibular system at the same time. Now, this is, again, this is important because these are the results that you're going to see as far as performance is concerned uh, within, five, within 35 seconds, uh, if possible. Uh, this is, again, with an athlete. You'll also see those results with kids. This is in three weeks in their sagittal plane. 
and you'll also see results in elderly. As long as we're working with 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 a nervous system that is uh, that is healthy, then they will respond to the sensory stimulation. But what's really important is that the changes that you're seeing here are going to stick with time. I'm done. Wow. Okay, I've got a million questions, but sadly we're running out of time. So, um, Annette, you said that you're on Instagram. You're on Facebook as well. Yeah, Posture Pro. Uh, all the way across the board. You can find me on, on YouTube where I put infor informative videos. It talks about all of these um, uh, different, um, all of these different um, uh, exercises and uh, Posture Pro on Facebook and on Instagram as well. Okay, super. So we'll put all of that up on the web so that people can refer to them to see if they can try those and see a difference in their strength or posture. Um, so I want to thank uh, Ryan, Annette, and Tanya for um, bringing us all that information on how to take care of our bodies outside of the regular yoga room. Um, and I guess I'm going to turn it over to you, Ron or Eric. Uh, you can turn it over to me. Thanks very okay. much. Thanks. Okay. Thanks very much again to our presenters. Uh, now I think I've got some use for the, uh, the little roller that I have, which I never use, or the little spiky ball that I have that I never, I never use <laughs> as well. So thanks again. Um, our next uh, town, uh, town hall is in a couple of weeks and we'll be discussing uh, away races or goal races and uh, we'll be dis discussing North American races. And also uh, I'd like to uh, uh, provide a reminder that uh, starting tomorrow, our registration might even open up today. We've got our uh, second uh, virtual small boats race in the spring series. Um, and uh, with that, we've also got um, the ability to have six people come together in a cohort, uh, what we're calling a cohort. You're actually racing uh, separately to remain physically distanced, but your times are being combined together. Uh, and, and that way uh, we can maybe get some, some groups competing against other groups. And we did that for the first race as well, and it was pretty successful. So um, that's uh, on the CORA web website for registration. So, um, um, so that... Uh, uh, window is uh, open for two weeks, so you've got lots of time to uh, to run your race course. And uh, the race courses uh, requirements are on the website as well. They're a little bit different this year um, because um, um, the uh, the short course uh, Don wanted uh, uh, an out and back, and then uh, for the long course um, uh, Scott at uh, Fraser Valley wanted a uh, a loop. So we've got uh, an out and back short course uh, from Don at Penticton, and then a, uh, a loop for the long course from Scott at, uh, at uh, Fraser Valley. Okay, and- uh, Rob, uh, uh, Our registration for that race uh, opens tomorrow morning. Oh, tomorrow morning? Okay, thanks, Eric. So thanks again to our presenters today. Uh, and uh, that's it for our session today. Thanks very much. Look for, look for information on, on these topics on the CORA website and um, as well as the recording. Thanks very much, everybody. Thanks, bye-bye everyone. Thank you very much.